is Kriti and you're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. You're listening to Root of Conflict, a podcast about violent conflict around the world and the people, societies and policy issues it affects. In this series, you'll hear from experts and practitioners who conduct research, implement programs, and use data analysis to address some of the most pressing challenges facing our world. Root of Conflict is produced by UC3P in collaboration with the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, a research institute housed within the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Well, I actually have a very um, interesting anecdote. Um, on 2017, a year after the peace agreements were signed, I was working in Monteria, uh, in the northern part of Colombia. This city is one of the epicenters of the ongoing com- um, conflict in, in my country. And um, during the night, I went to this uh, to this show of five former FARC combatants, um, they were playing Andean music, and the show was organized by a social leader in, in Monteria, and the objective was basically to um, foster reconciliation scenarios. And back then I couldn't imagine combatants holding anything anything different than weapons in their hands. So it was very touching, and at the end of the, of the show, I hugged him because I was very moved by the whole experience. And I congratulated him and thanked him for, for the experience. And and he just smiled and he laughed and he was like, Oof, yeah, this has been great, but I just hope I don't get killed. He's 21 years old. This was two years ago and uh, a couple of weeks ago in Colombia, we celebrated the first local elections after the peace agreement. And I heard that he was elected as part of the, of the, of the municipal council. Uh, he's very young and he's very brave. And he he passed from being threatened of, of death to actually represent his community. Uh, he's also part of the LGBTI community in a very conservative city. So this, just to say that um, the beautiful thing about the peace agreement is that it just changed the narrative of the country. My name is Mwangi Thuita. I'm one of the producers of Root of Conflict. In 2016, the Colombian government signed a peace agreement with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, a militant group whose insurgency against the government lasted over 50 years. The agreement was not without its critics. When first put to a referendum in October 2016, it failed, with 50.2% voting against it. Almost two months later, the government signed a revised agreement, which was then ratified by Colombia's Congress. The final agreement addressed topics such as rural reforms, political participation, the end of hostilities, solutions to the production of illegal drugs, the rights of victims, and the mechanisms of implementation and verification. Critics of the agreement complained that the terms were too lenient. Guerrillas would not serve time in prison. They would automatically be awarded 10 seats in Congress. Some claimed that the deal would legalize narco-trafficking and legitimize violence within the country. One of the people responsible for ending the conflict is Sergio Jaramillo, who served as chief peace negotiator for the government. On a recent visit to the University of Chicago, as part of the Pearson Institute's Distinguished Speaker Series, Mr. Jaramillo sat down with Manuel Bustamante and Marina Mileshevska to discuss his role in the peace process and how the lessons learned during the negotiations can be applied to conflict resolution efforts around the world. You gave the inaugural lecture of the Pearson Institute back in 2017, and on that occasion, your lecture was titled The Possibility of Peace. Let me just start by asking you, what is the Colombian peace agreement in your own words, and are you optimistic about its its implementation? Well, first, let me thank you for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be back here at the Pearson Institute. I have very good memories of the lecture two years ago. The Colombian peace agreement is an agreement that ended a 50-year war, 53-year war, actually, between the state of Colombia and the largest insurgency in the history of Latin America, which was the FARC. But it is also an agreement that tried to establish measures so that this violence would not recur. So it's not simply an agreement about DDR 
although it's also that. It's an agreement that tries to address the factors that kept the violence going over these years. The implementation of the agreement is naturally tied to the political situation. Well, we have a government that won the elections a year, year and a half ago on a platform of opposition to the peace agreement. So that, in principle, uh, does not look very promising. But actually, I think that reality itself is pushing everyone in the right direction. The Colombian institutions, the, the judiciary, the constitutional court, the Congress remain very committed to the peace agreement, and especially the communities on the ground are very committed to the peace agreement. So the, the government is slowly but surely waking up to the fact that the best thing to do is to implement the peace agreement and seems now to be taking slowly a more positive view. Many of us wonder what it took for one of the world's most protracted civil armed conflicts, a so-called intractable conflict lasting more than 50 years, as you just said, to finally end in 2016. What were some of the reasons that you believe the negotiation with Colombia's largest Korea group, which we know of as FARC, succeeded in 2016, when peace processes in Colombia had previously failed time and time again? Yes. Well, the first thing I would say is that we tried, we did our best to learn from our own past mistakes. I am a big believer myself in the idea of lessons learned. If you know what you're doing and you understand that each case is different, you can learn a lot from others. But you can learn the most from the mistakes you've made in the past. And so we tried this time to do things differently, to be very careful. In that Pearson lecture, I refer to what I call a strategy of prudence of doing things step by step. And I think there the critical move was to begin with secret talks to agree to a framework agreement. I think really that framework agreement set the whole process on very solid rails. Framework agreement took six months of secret talks, February to August 2012. Final agreement took four years from October of 12 to October, November of 16 still having agreed already not just to the subjects we were going to talk, but, number one, to the narrative that this was about ending the conflict, coming up with a new narrative that sent a clear message to Colombia that this time it was serious, and, secondly, agreeing previously to what you might call the structure of the deal. It was already clear that there had to be disarmament, that there had to be political participation, but there was also going to be justice for the victims, that there was also commitment from the government to do rural development. Uh, some of the more difficult things had already been previously agreed in the framework agreement, so that it then became a question more of fleshing out that than of striking the basic deals. I think that was the... There were many other things that were important, but I, I think that may have been the, the critical move. As you said, major strides have been made in resolving the Colombian conflict, but other countries around the world, such as Syria... Yemen and Venezuela continue to struggle in the face of internal crises. Can you share with us some of the insights that you learned from the negotiation process with the FARC in Havana? And how do you think policymakers can apply them to conflict resolution and peacebuilding efforts beyond Colombia? Again, I think that one should always be humble and not think that one knows everything and try to learn from others. But of course, as economists would say, you cannot just take the best practices from one place and put them somewhere else. I mean, you need to sort of understand where you're coming from and what your own needs are. So one has to also be quite humble at the time of offering anybody any wisdom from one's own experience. But I do think there are certain things that we did that can be applied in many places that have to do more with the structure of the negotiation. I mentioned a moment ago the idea of doing first a framework agreement in secret talks. I think in situations as difficult, for example, as Afghanistan today, uh, with which I'm a little bit familiar, it seems to me that would be exactly the right thing to do. Because once you go public, you come under massive pressure from society. There are all kinds of different interests. And the negotiators have much more difficulty in doing things because they have to always be looking over the shoulders, looking back making sure they're not upsetting their own constituency. Uh, so they lose a lot of margin of maneuver. 
a lot of flexibility that is sometimes needed to come to a consensus. So I think that's one thing. Another thing is is being very methodical, preparing things very carefully. If you look at the situation in Venezuela, which is absolutely tragic, the world is not conscious of the human tragedy that is happening today in Venezuela. And yet it has now been going on for a number of years at this level. And above and beyond the politics, part of the reason also is that they've had great trouble organizing themselves around what talks should look like and and having a disciplined approach to talks and preparing themselves. I think preparation is critical to success. You need to really have as clear a map in your head as possible of what you want to achieve. You cannot just sit down. Talks are not about sitting down and talking to somebody. Talks are about having a clear plan of where you want to go to and trying to see how you fit your counterpart within that plan. And there are other things, but I will I will stop with those. So many of us, and especially I, me that I'm uh, Colombian, don't understand how the referendum held in 2016 to ratify the peace agreement with the FARC resulted in people rejecting the agreement, albeit by a very low margin. The resulting peace treaty was one of the 14 unam unanimously adopted decisions in the United Nations Security Council in history. What do you think went wrong, and how do you think that the public narrative regarding the peace process in 2016 shaped this result? First, we need to recognize that we lost the referendum in uh, October of 2016. But we also need to tell your listeners that, sadly, the turnout was low. Actually, it was very low. Only about 37% of Colombians participated. And the no vote won by 0.3 of a percent. So, in the end, it was only 18% of Colombians who rejected the agreement and won by 0.3%. So, uh, in terms of the legitimacy of the result, well, it was it was low. It has to be said that if it had been the other way around, it would have been also a problem for us you know, to win with such a low turnout and such a low percentage. The campaign itself, as many know, was very similar to what had happened a few months before in, in the UK with Brexit. A lot of things were said that had nothing to do with the agreement. A lot of stories were put out that we were going to corrupt children, that we were going to introduce something they called gender ideology, that we're going to turn Colombia into Venezuela. And of course, all that affected things. But still, a lot of people voted against because they just rejected the FARC. And they obviously, they, they, were, they had their also the good right not to be in agreement. So we also have to be humble enough to sort of understand what it was, above and beyond the lies that went wrong. Did we not explain carefully enough? That's something that still needs more analysis, including from our side, from those of us who are promoting the yes vote, especially from us. And your conversation today at the Pearson Distinguished Speaker Series is titled How to Change a Society. Some of the issues that were included in the agreement with the FARC are not only issues that the FARC has been fighting for, but that the whole country desperately needs, such as rural development. However, the Colombian state has been remarkably incapable at providing them. What do you think that it will take for Colombian institutions to finally get to a point in which they are able to tackle these questions? Do you think we are close to getting to that point? No, not particularly. <laughs> But I do think that the peace agreement, a peace agreement in the end is, is an opportunity for change. It does introduce some change itself directly, such as stopping a war, which is not a, a minor thing. <laughs> stopping the violence that's derived from that war. But mainly, it creates a framework for change, and it has to be taken advantage of. It's not going to happen on its own. So, for example, a major program derived from the peace agreement are a series of programs called Rural Development Programs with a Territorial Approach. There are 16 large development programs which cover more than a fifth, perhaps close to a quarter of Colombian territory, and that are uh, designed to precisely bring development to the regions of the country that were hardest hit by the conflict, but also, in a sense, to repair. They're a form of reparations of damage done and the suffering. And they're premised on the idea of a very strong participation through a, a so-called participatory planning process. The good news is that this has happened. Close to 250,000 people have participated in these programs. And the government, the new government, even though it was not sympathetic to the peace agreement, 
is taking this program seriously.